through these notes. We're not going to hit um, everything that's on here, but we will a lot just to kind of um, emphasize some things. Actually, that over there. And that over there. So, to begin with, let me. Um, Kill these lights just a little bit. I thought it would be a bit more than that, but that's okay. Um, so, actually, it's page two. This is based on an earlier uh, edition of the text. Uh, you get this definition of language. This is on page two of, of Origins at the um, top of the page. Language is arbitrary, conventional, and systematic. Right? It's a system of conventional vocal signs which human beings, which enable human beings to communicate. Um, in this edition, that sentence is modified slightly. A language is a system of conventional vocal signs by means of which human beings communicate. Notice an important word in there that would, if we took this literally, mean that someone who is a deaf mute could not communicate or would not use language vocal okay. everywhere else in this text ASL American Sign Language is counted as a language right? but this definition kind of obscures that let's say so what that means is you've got to take that, that sentence and unpack it and look at kind of each individual word. So, system. Anything that is systematic is what? Like the central nervous system of the human body. Organized. It has order. It has structure. It follows certain laws or patterns. If the central nervous system of our bodies were not organized, structured, and patterned, we couldn't live. If it were chaotic, if the brain was just firing off, you know, specific things variously, we, we couldn't exist in a group like this because we'd all be doing strange and odd things. So, it's a logical pattern, structure, or framework that is followed or obeyed in all language systems. That is, all languages have a system. Are they all the same system? No, they are not. All languages, however, have a grammar. Grammar doesn't mean you don't end a sentence with a preposition. The grammar is the system. It's like the, the architectural structure of a building, not the facade put on the outside of that building. What is the architect architectural structure of the human body? It's the skeleton. Everything else hangs on that skeleton. If we didn't have skeletons, what would we be? Octopus. Because it doesn't have a skeleton. Okay? So, the grammatical structure of a language. In English, SVO. Subject, verb, object. I went to the store. Subject, I, went, verb, object, to the store. Okay. I should have said in modern English. Because when we go back to earlier forms of the English language, for example, Old English, word order is not as important. In modern English, word order is completely important. Word order tells you everything. Because, what's the difference between, and I'm sorry, I always use violent examples, but you know. What's the difference between those? I hit the dog, the dog hit me. <laughs> I'm doing the action here. I'm receiving the action here. <laughs> This is doing the action. How do I know? Because it comes before the verb in modern English. Okay? 
in Anglo-Saxon, you can have the dog before the verb and yet receiving the action. How? Because the dog would have an ending on it. Hund would have some kind of ending. That silent E I talked about the other day, it would be an E plus something else. Or maybe another vowel plus something else. Okay? And this would be itch, which is where we get our I from. Okay? This would tell me, ah, that's nominative case. That is subject. So wherever you see an itch standing on its own in Old English, you know that's the subject. It never changes. That will always be the subject. Similarly, where you see W E, that will always be a subject. Why? It's first person plural, we. Okay. What's the difference between we and us? We and our. Our is possessive. We is not. Us means something's happening to us. It's receiving the object. So it's either dative or accusative, depending upon what the, what's happening with the subject and the verb. We'll talk about the cases in, in uh, not today, not any more than this, um, probably Tuesday or Thursday of next week, okay? So, a sign. A thing that stands for or represents something uh, or that represents another. Means what? No smoking. Does this ever mean walk your dog here? No. It always and only means that other thing. This often, but not always, represents what? Christianity. But sometimes it represents what? It's just a T. It's not always a cross. Sometimes it's just a you know, T. So, the linguistic sign or word, because all words are signs. Apple represents, you know, that hard red fruit. Or we can use this. The linguistic sign B-O-T-T-L-E represents this. Now, why do I say it represents this? It points to this but is not necessarily this. Well, who created the word bottle? Don't know. But whoever did, that person assigned a name to it. What could that person have called this? Wallet. And this could have been bottle. See, it's arbitrary. There is nothing that about this that has inherent bottledness. Okay? <coughs> so in that sense, language is arbitrary. But we have to agree on what this means. If I were to say, this is a bottle, and Lavandre comes in and says, no, it's not. No, it's not. That's gun. And I say, give me your bottle, and she hands me a, what I consider G-U-N, we're, what's going to happen with our communication? <laughs> it's not going to work. So we have to agree. That's why we get to the next word. It's a convention. A convention doesn't mean a coming together, like convention means in other contexts. It means it's something that is commonly agreed upon. And this is where the history of the English language can get really slippery. Because what happens when words start to change their meanings? What happens if one group accepts one meaning of a word and another group accepts an older meaning of the word? So I see somebody come into class one day. Trevor comes in one morning. He's just had a great week. It's going fantastic. And I say, wow, Trevor, you're really gay today. 
What can that mean? Well, in one context, it means he's really happy. In another context, it means he's the other meaning of gay. He's homosexual today, as opposed to yesterday when he was straight. Okay? <laughs> Little, we start to run into problems there. So we have to accept those conventions. Because if we don't, if I say be to class on time, and you start understanding class as being at Main Street, the bar, <laughs> or Liquid Smoke, and I show up, and you're not here, and you're at Liquid Smoke, and I say, okay, okay, I get it. Let's meet at Liquid Smoke, 8 o'clock Tuesday night, and you all show up here, and I show up there, I'm going to go, cool, <laughs> that'd be fine. Vocal, I, you know, I don't need to describe vocal. It's a sound made by the vibration of the vocal cords. It even sounds like, there's a slight movement of the vocal cord there, okay? Communicate, you know, to share one's thoughts, ideas, feelings, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So when we talk about human language, it involves all of this. So basic terms, ideas that we have to go through, and we'll try to go through kind of quickly. Linguistics, study of human speech and language. If you're more interested in linguistics than you are in the term I put up over here the other day, philology, the study of the history of the language to better enable you to interpret, decipher, understand texts. That is, if you're just interested, and I don't mean just like it's lesser, but if this is your primary interest, is in the sounds of the language, the grammar of the language. Get together with Dr. Albakri or Blackwell, who are both professors of linguistics, okay? And they'll, they'll go into more linguistics than you ever want to know. Actually, maybe not if you really get into linguistics, okay? There are two kinds of linguistics, many other kinds, what we're doing in here. Diachronic, the historical study of the evolution of language over time. And synchronic, the study of a language at a particular point of development. So, for example, when I used to teach Old English at the graduate level, that was actually both synchronic and diachronic. It was synchronic in that we only looked at Old English. That is, we only looked at the period of the English language from roughly 500 to 1100. We didn't talk about Middle English. We didn't talk about Early Modern English. We didn't talk about Contemporary English. So it's synchronic in that it's focusing on one period. It's diachronic because we looked at the development of the language over that roughly 600 years. What we're doing in this class is entirely diachronic. Dia, like diameter, diameter, across. Chronic time, okay? Um, you could do synchronic. I mean, you could look at the history of the language in a 10-year span. That is, any language you could do that to, or 100 years span. For example, you know, the history of the English language from 1500 to 1600, huge changes, or 1600 to 1700, or even better, 1500 to 1700. That's when all the long vowels, pretty much that period, all the long vowels change from the Middle English form of the vowel to our form of the vowel. They all, what's called, shift. They move up one step in the vowel triangle that we'll talk about maybe today, probably today, okay? Uh, philology, study of language, skip all that for the purpose of the study of literature or texts, if you want. Morphology, study the smallest meaningful units of a language. What's the smallest meaningful unit of language? Take a word like... Girls. There are two meaningful units in that word. What are they? Girl and z. Okay. What's the z? Plural. plural. Why? How do you know it's plural? Because there's no apostrophe. How do you indicate an apostrophe in speech? You don't. So when you speak, it's context that tells the listener whether or not it's possessive or plural, OK? 
Okay. Anti-disestablishmentarianism. There's an awful lot of what are called morphemes in that. Morphemes are the smallest meaningful units of a language. Prefixes, suffixes, roots. Okay. What about, go back to this one, just this. Good. Is that a meaningful unit of language? That is, does that tell you content? Nope. It's just a sound. That's called a phoneme. Okay. We're all familiar with the phonemes, though we may not be able to name them. So, pff, that's a phoneme. Um, morphology study, smallest phonology study of the sounds of a language. Morpheme, the smallest meaningful unit. A phoneme, the smallest distinctive unit of a language. So how many phonemes are there in the world girl in the word girls? G, u, r, u, z. Girls. Depending upon how you pronounce it. Okay. How many pro, uh, phonemes are there in this or this? E, u. There are three. Not four phonemes. Why? That's the same sound. This one? It, ooh. It's the same sound. It's not doubled. You don't go, ho, oh, unless you're weird. <laughs> or in some parts of the South, this becomes this. <laughs> heel. Go over that heel over there. Okay. Or as some people have pronounced my, my name, when my wife and I got married, she had some cousins... Most of her family is from, her extended family is from South Georgia. You know, and so I walk in from the side with the other groomsmen and such, and one of her little cousins, who is, I don't remember, nine, ten years old, stands up in the middle of the church and goes, there's Ted. <laughs> Ted becomes Ted. Ted. Okay. I think another one actually made my name into three syllables. Um, grapheme. A grapheme is a written character in a traditional writing system. Doesn't have to be English, it can be Slavonic for that matter. But it's different from a phoneme because what does a grapheme do? A grapheme, a grapheme attempts to represent sound. For example, how do we represent p, as in P, P E A? I just told you. Yeah. That. How do we represent? V? Those are graphemes. Okay. Um, allophone, insignificant variation within a phoneme. Some of you will say the word whale, and you will still have a little when you say that word. Why? Because this word is actually Old English, Hwala. So why do we spell it WH instead of HW? Because of French. Because French does not have any words that begin with a H sound. So the French, because of the Norman Conquest, the spelling gets reversed. And because the spelling gets reversed, as we were talking about the other day, with spelling pronunciation, gradually that initial <gasps> drops. Okay? Here's another example of an allophone. Um, top. Put your hand in front of your mouth. If you have a lighter, pull out a lighter, light it, and go top. There's no something coming up. St However, if you say stop, you get an explosion of error. Or I might have those exactly reversed. One of one of them, you get a, okay. In fact, do like P and t, boom, a lot of air comes out. Not much, okay. 
Those are insignificant. Those little aspirations are relatively insignificant, okay? Sound shift. We'll talk more about sh um, sh sound. I'm going to mess that word up. <laughs> sound shifts in a couple weeks, but it's any kind of regular systematic change in the pronunciation of a language. For example, Shakespeare's Sonnet 18. Modern English, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And Shakespeare's English, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Okay. There's a shift that goes on with those vowels. Similarly, this is going to be part of the one that you're really going to hate. What's the Latin word for fish? It's one of the signs of the zodiac. Or piscus. It's actually with the U at the end. What's the English word for fish? Duh. Fish. What's the Latin word for head? It's from what we get caprum, caput. English word? Head. These are sound shifts. Where Latin words begin with a p, almost all German words begin with a f. What kind of doctor do you see if you've got a problem with your foot? A podiatrist. What kind of doctor do you see if you're German for your foot? A foot doctor. What kind of doctor do you see for your... You don't go to the toothist, right? You go to the dentist. D, t. Duo, two, okay? That's a sound shift. It occurs regularly, and we'll explain why. Makes it easier if you're trying to learn some foreign languages if you understand these sound shifts, okay? Because you can look at a word in English and say, okay, English develops from Germanic. If this is the English, this might be what the German is, or... German this equals Latin this. So if I see the German German this, that means in Latin it is, for example, p f. Your male parent is called what? And in Latin? And in Dutch? Because it's very similar. <laughs> Darth Vader? What does Darth mean? Nope. If you have a Darth of something, or use its correct pronunciation, a dearth of something, D-E-A-R-T-H, it means a lack of something. Darth Vader literally means lack of father. And if you know the Star Wars story, what is interesting about Anakin Skywalker? He's like Jesus. He doesn't have a earthly father, so to speak. Okay? So think of that. I mean, history of the English language and Star Wars. I mean, it's just, it's, it's all cool. Okay. Um, sound shift law, the explanation for those sound shifts. Inflections. Do we have many inflections in English? I don't mean inflections like I go up and down with my voice in class. Keeps people awake. Bothers other professors and the door, doors are open and such. Um, what kind of inflections do we have? I go to the store. You go to the store. He, she, it goes. That's an inflection. Okay. My dog... Your dog, the boy's dog. That's an inflection. We have very few inflections today. Learn German, learn French, learn Spanish, learn Italian. They all still have a ton of inflections. Okay. English has lost most of its inflections. Why? Because inflections are important when... Um, 
word order is not as important. Okay? And because in English, word order has become totally important, we've dropped off our inflections as the two have gone along. That is, it's not like somebody woke up one morning and said, you know, this just doesn't make any sense. So I'm going to start speaking subject, verb, object, and everybody else is going to have to follow me. No, it subject, verb, object developed while inflections started dropping off. We'll talk about that quite a bit when we get to the Middle English group. Okay? Um, you all know what affixes are. Smallest meaningful units attached to the beginning and the ends of words, like... Prohibit. Okay. That's an affix. We call it a prefix because it comes before. Similarly, it can be something at the end. Okay. But not prohibited. That's not an affix. That's a change in the actual verb form. Okay. Um, Edamon, the word from which another word is derived, or ultimately the earliest form of a word. When we get to the Indo-European stuff, we're going to do a, a bunch of stuff with Indo-European and how a lot of our words today derive from Indo-European. For example, let's go back to the, the um, word I used earlier and say, you know, I tell LaVondra to give me her bottle and she hands me a gun. But she doesn't just hand me a gun that is out and open. It is in something that contains a gun. What do you call that thing that can't contain a gun? Not case, holster. Okay. Holster is related to the word seller. And sell. And hole. As in H-O-L-E. Okay. Those, those all go back to a common Indo-European root. And it essentially means something that encloses. Or encapsulates. It's also related to the word hall. Like, you know, Peck Hall, it's like hell, you can't you come in, you can't go out. Hotel California kind of a thing. <laughs> That's what it seems like half the time. Etymology, study of the origin and history of words. I don't know about you, but I, I think this is totally cool. When you start to look at a word and you trace it back to see what it meant over time and how it developed in its um, meanings. Cognate, two or more words in different languages which are related, like fish. And piscus, like father and pater, how are those related? Well, once German, father, pater is Latin, it's a Romance language. All the Romance languages devolve from Latin. As uh, I had a Latin professor tell me, you know, learn Latin because all the Romance languages are nothing but bad Latin. If you learn the Latin, you can pick up French, Italian, Spanish, etc. Um, on your own. Okay? So, Oh, those are all sisters. Why? They derive ultimately from a single common source. Spoken by Proto-Indo-Europeans somewhere five to, depending upon your Indo-European scholar, somewhere between 3,000 and maybe as far back as 7,000 BC. Okay? There was one word for father. And it devolves into all those various forms that we have today. Okay? Stop. Now we're getting to, these are describing phonemes. A sound made by a total stop of air in the, in the uh, oral or vocal cavity. If you like. So what's an example of one? What kind of sound do you make? Let's say the sounds in the English alphabet, broadly construed, that is a stop where you stop all the air before you let it out. That's a stop. B. That's a stop. M. Okay. M isn't quite the same, but it's similar. T. K. G. G. You're stopping it way back here in the throat. K. You're stopping it a little higher. B. T. D. It stopped with the lips. T. It stopped with the teeth. D. Is stopped with the teeth. Okay, those are all stops. Fricative, it's a phony made with a rubbing sound. You can feel it. 
the rubbing is actually beginning back here in the vocal cords. Those are all fricatives. Africans, a combination of these two. J. J. Notice, it starts kind of like a J, but it also kind of has a J in it. Okay? So, J. Like bridge, church, those are Africans. Nasals, everybody knows what a nasal is. Just listen to Fran Drescher. <laughs> Pull up the nanny on YouTube and, oh boy, what do you do? You throw all that sound up into the nasal um, cavity if you want. Okay. So, a simplified international phonetic alphabet. And I'm not going to, you know, Go through these, but and I'm not going to actually go through these either, except for a couple, because you all know what those sounds are because I've given you the words. Notice the sound can be spelled with a C or a K. Okay? So the vert, you got the fricatives, and then you get down to this one, and notice both of these graphemes, these are symbols we're using to represent sound, are not in the tr traditional English or Roman alphabet, okay? That's a Greek theta, and that is an Anglo-Saxon thorn. That's the letter, what it's called. What sound is that? That's the th It's smooth, is how it's often described. It's like in thin, third, with. Not with, with, right? That's a fricative. There's going to be a, a, another form later. And then you, you know, the z, it's not genre, by the way. Z, genre. It's not, depending upon your dialect, is it garage or garage? Or garage. <laughs> Azure, pleasure. Leisure or leisure, okay? Shine, sure. Um, go down a little bit. Africans, that's the j, gem, judge, church, nasals. This is one, you know, it's kind of ing. It's thing, finger. Sing, it's not sing er, it's sing. Okay? So you represent that with a, as a kind of a tailed in, if you want. <clears throat> um, liquids. What do we mean by liquid? The sound is made by the, the flow of air rolling around the tongue. Okay? Notice your tongue isn't touching. The roof of the mouth, the bottom of the mouth, the teeth, the lips, the sides of the mouth, etc. The tongue is doing something with all those others. Right? Um, then you get to. <coughs> Wait. Am I missing? Oh, there it is. I was wondering, where in the world is our s and z? Because then you have the z and sh. Okay. Uh, vowels. Now, again, we could get more... What's the word I want? Um, this is a simplified international phonetic alphabet. You got the International Phonetic Alphabet revised to 2005 in the front of your book. There are about, I don't know, three times more symbols on this page than there are here. Why? Because this is representing all sounds in all languages. English only has 35, 36. Stick it, I'm not, sorry, but look at the person behind you is a. Um, Aren't you a speech pathology major? Mm -hmm. It's like 35 or 36 sounds. Okay? Something, something around that. But there are a lot more sounds than that. Okay? In various other languages. 
A lot of African languages, for example, with clicking noises, sounds like that, okay? So, with the vowels, a lot of these vowels, you might not hear any difference between the two sounds, okay? So, this form is used to represent the sound in father. This form is used to represent the sound in park or bark. Yes? I just want to throw a fact out there. In American English, there's 14 vowels. But in, wait, so that's the typical people that are speaking Spanish because there's only five vowels in their language. And that's about, I think that's about all of them. Okay. Yes? I have a question. Really? It's a different heading. Let me see if the one I have on here is different. Hmm. I wonder if I put up a different set of notes for you guys, because I didn't think I did. Um Do you print out the word? Document form of the notes or the PDF? Okay, that's why. When you print it out in Word, um, when you open that up in your computer, if your computer did not have the font that had this, it replaced it. So if you open it in PDF, these are all saved. These exact symbols are saved in the PDF. So you can open it up in anything else, and it should look just like that. I hope. Yes? There's actually, um, for the consonants as you put it out, there's actually different symbols entirely for some of the phonemes. Like for ch and j, the ones that you put out there, there's some that are completely different, so that might be kind of confusing. But huh. I mean, what you put is down is fine, but if someone else looks up at a different IPA chart online, oh, yeah, it'll yeah. be different. There's yeah. lots of different ones. Yeah, there. there are different, for example, for the, go back up here. For, for this, the J, what's the one? Um, it's like a D. The and D a, with the yeah, little. And a three next yeah. to it, kind of. Yeah, but it's it's not up next to it up here. It's dropped. It's, it? a, it's a little tailed like that. Yeah. yeah. And that's because it's they're trying to represent there graphemically the D with the kind of G I joined together. Well, three in my brain. The phonic je, that's the, that little three is je. Yeah. And I feel like that je, in my head it's not the same. Well, it like looks like it's smushed together. Right. Um, yeah, so this is not, you know, um, how do I put it at the top? A phonetic alphabet. I don't think I have it at the top of yours. Yeah, a simplified international phonetic alphabet. That is, I've, a couple of the symbols, like um, the J and I think the J, I've used an older form of the IPA. Okay? Um, simply because you can do, I think almost all of these symbols are available in Times New Roman. But not all IPA symbols are available in Times New Roman. For all IPA symbols, you've got to download the IPA font, which you can get for free. Okay. Um, back to where I was. So, I don't know if you hear a difference between father and park. I don't. But there is one. Apparently. Okay. So, but between father and cat, that's pretty clear. You ought to be able to hear that. Now, that symbol that's used for the ass sound, that symbol is called ash. It's an old English letter. It's an old English symbol. Okay? So whenever you have that a, ah, that's how you would represent it. Okay? But then the next one, pet, met, my name, Ted, it's not Ted. Not teed, not teed. Pet, met. Use the Greek epsilon. Okay. Now, if we were going to get really particular, these are not all the same sounds. 
Wait, make cafe, the A at the end, and snake. Those vowels, those A vowels, are not all exactly the same. This one is a little bit different than the other three. But most people hear them all the same. This is closer to what's called a... I'll oh, change my brain. I gotta find the word. It's not here. Yes, Okay? Because you kind of start to make the A, and then there's a slight if. Wait. Wait. Okay? <clears throat> if, E, O, like in Faulkner, bought, not bought, B-O-T, bought, okay? Um, hope, or law, hope, ugh. So don't say book. Hope. You don't say put. You don't say sugar. Put, put, sugar. Ooh. Boom. You. Shoo. Schwa. What is schwa for English? It is the default vowel sound we make. How do you know? Do a public presentation. And when you're at a loss for word, you uh. And if you're English, you go uh. For some reason, I don't know why, but the Brits, the Brits don't default to uh. It's er. Okay? Um, e, T, T. If you're old Bugs Bunny, um, Warner Brothers cartoons fan, Pepe Le Pew. Okay? That's E, French T. Semi vowels, yeah. So why do we use a quote unquote J and not a Y? Yar, yavor, ya. Okay. What? What? When? Well, diphthongs. What's a diphthong? You've got two sounds said very closely together, and you're moving. You're gliding from one to the other. I, I. I mean, you can really accentuate it. I. Okay. White, I mean Cockney English, really stretches these out. White, white, moi. Or go to tidal coastal Virginia, Chesapeake Bay. You can still hear this. Okay. Ow, house, town, how now brown cow. Old English and Middle English, who knew brown coo? It's an example of the vowel change. Who do brun coo becomes how now brown cow? Unless you still live in northern Scotland, in which case you talk about the Highland Coos. Okay? And then oi. Like oi! <laughs> or boy, noise, etc. Okay? And then there are just a couple other graphemes for a couple other sounds that we'll need. You Essentially, the X. To represent the German doch, it's back here. It's not on the front of the mouth. It's not towards your lips like German ich, ich. That's in the front of the mouth. Doch, bach, loch. Okay? And then we don't have this in English, but we do have it in Old English and we have it in Middle English. Zagen, zagen. And I'm emphasizing there, I'm stretching it out. Zagen. It's not g. Zaga. Get that sound kind of going back there. Zagen. Okay? This is going to be important because it's how we get from Old English fool to foul. Okay? Um, <coughs> notes for phonetic transcription. So you enclose ver uh, phonemes, individual sounds, within backslashes, if you want to call them that. The actual name is a virgule. So you put in slashes, okay? As in pet, if you're putting just the P part in that, you would do this. And if you're spelling the rest of the word, okay? You put a transcription, an entire word,
within brackets. Pet. So, knowing what you know from that phonetic transcription, what is, or from those, um, that simplified form of the alphabet, what is this? Either this or this. It's not a modern English word, but it is an English word. Vine. Very good. Actually, shouldn't have used that one because that's not proper. Use this one. The reason that wasn't proper, I messed up with this. Thin. Why is it not vine? Zzz. Vine would be this form. Uh, okay, right. Zzz. That's the voiced form. Okay. How about? This. Seat. 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 As opposed to sit. sit. Okay. What about this? How's it spelled? You can't tell how it's spelled. You don't know which form of heel it is. Is it H-E-E-L or is it H-E-A-L? Or is it Southern H-I-L-L? -L? <laughs> okay. Louder? I heard somebody say it. Bridge. Okay. So those are all examples of, of transcriptions. Now, you can do entire passages. Your book has passages from Shakespeare written out like that. Okay. To show you what Shakespeare's pronunciation was. Because once you have the, the IPA, once you have the symbols for the sounds and you... Put the two together in your mind. Then when you read something, you know, because I don't remember which form I used. And that's so small, I can barely read it. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I don't, I've got to be careful because I'm not sure if I'm using the same vowel sounds that you are. This continues over here. Um, nope. Okay, I don't want to sound like stop there. Five words. I said these earlier. Shall I compare thee to? Notice what is not at the end of this. What's the modern English word there? L. What's not at the end? Why? Because you don't say it. 
So where there are silent vowels, you don't say them. Night, which kind? Knigget night? K-N-I-G-H-T or N-I-G-H-T? You can't tell. Okay? You can't tell just by a transcription of an individual word. Now, usually you don't just transcribe individual words. What you do if you're trying, you know, you're going into a, um, a group that doesn't have a written alphabet. They don't have a written form of their language. So what do you have to do? You've got to go, or you're going to a group that you don't know their language at all. Um, a guy, the, the founder of the Summer Institute of Linguistics named Kenneth Pike, founded a whole branch of linguistics called tagmemics. Um, when I was in college, uh, I had a linguistics course, and the linguistics professor brought Pike to school for, I don't remember what it was, a week or something like that. And he gave a couple of linguistic demonstrations, okay? And one of the students at the college, this was a small Christian liberal arts school down outside Chattanooga, one of the students at the college was from somewhere in Africa, I don't remember where. He spoke English pretty good, but he also spoke a native African language. And nobody knew what this other language was. And um, Pike didn't know the language. He, he literally didn't know the language that this kid spoke. And down in front of the auditorium, they, you know, began with the introduction of Kenneth Pike and all this kind of stuff, and didn't say anything about the student, if I remember correctly. And they started talking. That is, um, the student just started talking. And Pike stood there and listened. And, you know, uh, after the student stopped, Pike kind of went, he just nodded his head. And then he started pointing to things. No. And the guy said the word for chair. So, Pike kind of noted that down, and then he started doing this. Well, this could be what? Could be cheekbone, could be head, could be this, kind of more his head, right? And in the space of about 45 minutes, Pike learned enough of the phonemes and the morphemes of the language that he started speaking to the kid. Why? Because he'd been doing it for all of his adult life. I mean, he was in his 70s, I think, by this, by this time. And he used to work for um, Wycliffe Bible Translators. And he'd go off to places in South America Guinea, etc., um, Aboriginal tribes in, in Australia, because not all the Aboriginal peoples speak the same language, and would live with them for a while, pick up their language, develop a written form of it. Why? So he could, you know, put Jesus in their hands, so to speak, uh, in terms of the New Testament and such. But in, in doing that, he showed, you know, this is how you can quickly learn what somebody else is saying and how they're saying it and pick up on their grammar. Because in listening to the guy, he was able to determine, ah, object here came before the verb. And subject came at the end. It was a uh, object, verb, subject language rather than English, subject, verb, object. Okay? So... Um, I mean, we just did a few transcriptions here. Now, your first exam will have some transcriptions that you will tell me what they are, what those words are. Those transcriptions might have, might include words that can be spelled in more than one way. That is, they might be more than one word. You'll have to give more than one. And I think, um, I don't know that I'll do this. Sometimes in the past I've said, okay, turn to, and okay, now I'm going to read you five words. Transcribe these for me. So you will give an on-the-spot transcription of the words I give you. Some of them will have, they won't all be single syllable. Some will have two or three or four syllables. But they'll probably be 
relatively easy. Okay? Um, vowel triangle for modern English. What in the world are we talking about? What is a vowel triangle? This is where the vowels are made essentially in the mouth. Your book goes into a whole lot more detail. Okay? I'm doing a much more simplified one. Why? Because I'm not as concerned with how well you make your vowels in your mouth. Okay? What I'm concerned is, can you look at this? And when we go from Old English to Middle English and Middle English to Early Modern English, can you tell me what happens to these vowels? Okay? This is, as I said, for Modern English. So, front, central, and high. That refers to the placement of the tongue. Front of the mouth, middle of the mouth, back of the mouth, okay? High, low. Is the tongue up towards the roof of the mouth, or is the tongue, you know, hanging down at the bottom of the mouth? So, these are also called tense and lax. Or tense and relaxed, if you want. So, what's this one? Go back to the International Phonetic Al Alphabet. E, I, A, E, E, O, O. It's the same for me. O, O, U, U. Okay. Notice the difference between E and U. E, E. Your face is all tense. Like you're going to die with rigor mortis and you're going to be like this. Ooh. Okay. Tense vowels, lax vowels. Front vowels, back vowels. These are made more with the tongue kind of pushing or receding, if you want, towards the back. So beneath that, you've got this. E as in... Machine, I as in with, e, e, A as in A, E as in deck, A as in cat, A as in park, A as in, A as in father, O as in Faulkner, O as in hope, U as in push, U as in U, U as in dumb, or U uh, if you want, as in dumb. Okay? Now, when we do Old English, we're going to see those same vowels, almost, but we're going to see something happen to them. Um, I'll give you a little, a little foretaste of that right now. I'm going to put a, a mnemonic device on the board. I'm going to put it in phonetic transcription. <clears throat> Got to make sure I get it right. Pretty close. Me fate ok sa do urs. That's old and middle English. Modern English. Well, that doesn't make any sense, right? In modern English. Do any of those words sound like any words in modern English? Me or my. Here's what happens. All of these vowels. That's a vowel, 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 that's a vowel. They all move over a period of two to three hundred years. It's called the Great Vowel Shift. Okay? Modern English spelling preserves some of the spelling forms of the Old English sounds, but it doesn't spell according to modern English sounds. So, modern English, this is My feet ache, so do ours. Okay, so look what's happened. 
take this vowel, vowel triangle, actually let me go up a little bit. Now I don't have in this, um, I don't have the diphthongs. But if I did, right up here, no, right up here would be that A capital I. Okay. Right up in here. It'd be higher than this. <coughs> the owl would be A, the capital U would be over here, and the oi would be in this area. Okay? So what happens? E shifts to I. E, I, E, I, E, I. It's higher in the mouth, so it shifts up this way. Then what happens? A shifts to E. A goes up here. Notice it skips right over this one. Okay. Then what happens? Ock becomes ache. Ock shifts over these. In modern English, what are kind of vowels are these? They're short vowels. These are not long vowels. What are the long vowels in English? A E I O U or U. A, E, I, O, U. All those others in modern English are considered short vowels. You know, you look in a dictionary. And what do they have over the vowel to indicate that they're short? This stupid little thing. And if they're long, what do they have over it? The macron, a line that indicates they're long. Okay? So, uh, that one became that one. Sa becomes so. This jumps up here. Okay. O becomes oo. This becomes this. And this becomes ow. That's the great vowel shift. Okay. So that when you read Chaucer, and Chaucer says, Juan dat April with his shore is soda. April, April. With his showers, showers, show, shall, etc. Okay, so sooth, if you want. Once you know the great vowel shift, you can start looking at some older text and go, oh, okay, so I see what this ought to be. All right, um, let's go ahead and I said we'd probably finish this part today. So now we're going to end up, we're going to be a little bit. Ahead, maybe half day ahead, which is fine because we'll get behind very quickly. So, origins of writing. And this gets really fun, I, I think at least. Maybe you have to be nerdy. Um, and I've got the same exact notes here that you guys have up here. Um, earliest complete. Writing system, fourth millennium BC. That's three to four thousand BC. Okay. Now I'm going to use BC all throughout. I'm not going to use BCE or CE. Why? Because what does BCE really mean? Okay, it's before the Common Era. What determines the Common Era? It's still the birth of Christ. They just don't want to use you know that. So you have embryonic writing as far back as twenty five thousand BC. Embryonic. What's the difference between an embryo and a baby? It's not fully developed. That is, we say that there's all this embryonic writing. Why? Because we find stuff with marks all over it, but we don't know what the marks mean. <laughs> we don't. True writing, you'll see later on, true writing indicates what? Or represents what? Real sounds. So, there are forms of writing, or that what we call writing, that aren't true writing. And we'll see so in just a moment. Okay? So, proto writing. And notice, I've got a question mark. Why? Because we don't know if this is starting to represent some sounds. These are some tablets found around. Uh, in Romania, from what's called the Vinca culture, 
roughly 5600 BC. That professor that I mentioned the other day, Sean Wynn, he did several digs in Romania. Some of the stuff that he showed us in class that he literally passed around for us to handle and everything was from this exact culture. And some of them had, you know, marks on pieces of pottery. Now, the marks might just be decorative. But when you start to see repeating patterns, it kind of makes you think, hmm, maybe there's more to it than just that. So here's some other stuff. Dispilio tablet symbols from Greece. Roughly, is that the same period? Same date? No. 5,260 B.C. Now, I don't know about you, but you look at that, and it sure looks to me like there's enough difference and, there, and there's enough variation. Maybe whoever inscribed this thing is trying to communicate something particular. For example, what does that look like? Bird. Bird. I would place money on a bet that whatever else is being communicated in here, something has to do with a bird, whether it is the, I've got one bird for you, or the sound for bird is used to represent something else, <coughs> as we will see when we get to hieroglyphics, or a little bit later on, I've got a rebus up here. So that leads us kind of to pictography. Pictographs, first true phase, a uh, first phase of true writing. Why? Because the pictures are representing ideas which sometimes represent sounds. Right? And you can have a story with pictographs. This is from Utah, United States, Utah, Great Gallery, Horseshoe Canyon. Canyonlands National Park. Notice you've got what look to be it's really good out there. There, that's a little better. You have what do these obviously look like? People without arms, maybe, or their arms are just close in by their body, and then you get whatever this thing is, <laughs> which you know UFO folks go. That's pretty clear. That's a, not a human. That's an <laughs> alien. That's an extraterrestrial creature, etc. Right? But it's thought this is telling a story. Okay? Look at the one beneath it. Pictograph telling of the coming of missionaries to Hispaniola. I'm assuming, I don't know this for sure, because I don't know much about these pictographs. That this is starting up here and is working left to right. Okay. Not all writing works left to right. What modern people read right to left? Israelis. Israelis. Okay. Ancient Greek developed a form, you'll see in a, in a few moments, developed a form that read left to right and then right to left. Think about that for a moment. You're reading along in a text <laughs> and you get to the end of a sentence. And then you just read that way. How efficient is that? I mean, that makes a lot of sense to write this way and then write this way and then write this. Because what are you not having to do over here? Go back to this place. For those of you who are old enough to remember real typewriters, you would type and then what would you have to do? You have to slam the carriage so that it goes back to the other side. Now you got the stupid word processor, and they all just you know do everything for you. Okay? So this is telling a story of missionaries coming. I'm trying to see if there are any, if I can see a cross anywhere on there. Indicating Christian. Yeah. I can. So, pictographs. This is just one example. After pictographs in the history of writing come ideographs. Pictograph. Graph meaning writing, inscription, scribing, carving. First part of the word, picto, pictures. It's picture writing. Ideographs. Now what are you doing? Graph, inscribing, carving, ideas. Yeah, wow. 
how do you carve and scribe right love? <laughs> Come on, you guys were in grade school. How's that for love? How about hate? <laughs> Big giant X's, you know. K, 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 you know. <laughs> so, with ideographs, you can start abstracting. Why? Because ideas are abstract. Right? How concrete are ideas? This is the problem I have with a, you know, I shouldn't go into this, but this is the problem I have with the university building a $40 million building for concrete management. It's not an idea. Concrete management is really how hard is concrete to manage? You mix it, it hardens. I've done it a lot. So abstraction is possible. What else? Numbers. How do you represent numbers in pictographs? Dr. Seuss, one fish, two fish, three fish. <laughs> you have one fish, and then you draw two fishes. What if you are using pictographs for an economic purpose, and you just took a shipment of 400 fish? It means you have to draw 400 fish. Okay? With a number system, you don't. You can draw. Four fish. And if you have another way of symbolizing 40, 400, 4,000, you can add that on. Right? This, is the, the, this is the basis for a lot of ancient scripts. Okay? For example, a couple of good examples here. Cuneiform. These are both from the British Museum, if I remember correctly. This is about, this is a text about Cyrus, king of the world. We go back to the Old Testament, okay? Gilgamesh, the flood, okay? But it's in cuneiform. How do you write in cuneiform? Anybody know? This originally, not this one, take it back. This one was. This was originally clay, wet clay. I think this is actually stone that it's um, carved in. This is wet clay, was wet clay, that someone took a reed, cut it, so that the reed had a certain shape ending, and then you start impressing the end of that reed in the clay. Kind of makes it hard if you make a mistake. Okay. But we do have pieces of cuneiform where there were obviously mistakes where somebody tried to flatten it out and put something else in. If you ever get an opportunity, if you've never been to London, if you ever get an opportunity to go to London, go to the British Museum. And every time I go to London, I can spend hours in there. My family's like, let's go do something fun. And just walk around. Because, for example, Sennacherib, who's mentioned in the Old Testament, you, you'll see the gates of Sennacherib, the gates into the capital city of Assyria. And these suckers are 20 feet tall. And they are just covered in Canaan all talking about Sennacherib and his great campaigns, etc. All date from about 7 800 BC. Okay? Here's another one. This one's talking about an allocation of beer. Okay? It's thought, it's thought that the earliest true form of writing was economic in origin. It was recording bill of sale. It wasn't recording how John loves Susie, or anything like that. I mean, we like to think, oh, romance is the great, you know, motivator. Nah, beer. <laughs> beer is the great motivator. <laughs> Why is that? There is something on that page, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. The development of cuneiform. Why are we having a problem, computer? Anything else showing up? Nope. It looks like we have more computers. Well, we can fix that. Very, what time do we have? We've got seven minutes. We'll fix that very quickly. Dot cam. So.
from here to here. Um, this shows you the development in cuneiform for the idea head. Kind of looks like what? Somebody with a big schnoz, I mean big nose. Okay. And then at some point, and there's another, um, how much are talking about? I usually use the form for the idea ox. OX, you know, animal out in the field, because that's the word that gives us our first letter of the alphabet. A comes from Aleph, right? And it starts off and it looks like a cow's head with horns. And the next development, <coughs> notice what's happened between here and here. It's the same shape. What's happened to it? It's turned. Okay. It's turned 90 degrees, and then it goes on. So that cow's head horn thing looks like um, this. And then what happens to it? It gets turned. And then that gets borrowed and developed, but it essentially stays what we see today. Okay? So you got a description there about going, about what's happening, oh, that's right, different one, about what's happening there. So then, analytic scripts. Analytic means what? If you analyze something, what do you do to it? You break it down, right? You dissolve it into its constituent elements. So with analytical scripts, what do you have happening? Pictograms and ideograms coming together. They're both being used, okay? It's a transitional phrase. This idea might have developed from the rebus. What's this rebus mean? I ate football, okay? So you have another one down here. Here, it's the letter H and an ear. Represents Hearing, okay? Keeps getting, that's not working. So, combination of ideograph or idio and logographs and phonographs. The big example hieroglyphics. And we've got a couple of different examples of hieroglyphics here. These are Greco Roman era hieroglyphics, that is, these are late. Relatively late hieroglyphics. This is from the tomb at Luxor down in um, central Egypt. Okay. They just look like a bunch of you know, squirrely lines, etc. But this is where it's really important. How much can I show you? There you have the Rosetta Stone. And you can't see it clearly in here, but you can on your notes. You've got one form of writing up here, another form here, and a third form here. Old Egyptian hieroglyphics up here, what's called demonic script here. Okay. And in Greek. Okay. What's the difference between demonic and old form hieroglyphics? How many of you remember... I shouldn't ask this question because I'll be angered if some of you say, well, I never do. How many of you ever were actually taught penmanship in grade school where you had to learn how to write cursive? Okay. How many of you still write like you were taught to write? Only one. So how do you write now? It's much quicker, right? The kind of writing you do now is much more quicker than if you're making all the proper loops and etc. This is kind of like cursive hieroglyphics. It's faster, it's quicker. Because cursive is supposed to be more quick than um, print, thank you, right? This was discovered as a result of Napoleon's conquest of Egypt. 
big old black basalt stone. It's about three feet tall, stands about this tall, it's about this wide. They found it, they said, cool. They took it to uh, France. Later, the Brits stole it, so it's now in the British Museum. When I first went to London in 1995 and went to the British Museum, I thought I had my head explode. This was just sitting there. It had a little sign, the Rosetta Stone, a little bit about it. But it wasn't under a box or glass or anything. And yeah, it had a sign that said, do not touch, but psh, yeah, right. <laughs> I and everybody else in there, you know, I had to let them up, you know, feeling the same like great. Now it's under a glass box, <laughs> right? Because they're idiots like me. Why is this important? Without this, we would still not know what hieroglyphics mean. Why? This had a key, exactly. This had Greek on it. And it was assumed the Greek was what these other two things said. And in the Greek text, there are these symbols. Or in some of the Greek texts, not all the way throughout, are included these symbols within this thing. Well, this exact same thing shows up up here. It's called a cartouche. And the two people who deciphered it, Champollion and Young, I don't think do I have their names on there? Yeah. Thomas Young and Jean-Francois Champollion. Champollion really stole his discovery from Thomas Young. Thomas Young doesn't get nearly the uh, credit he deserves. Um, they deciphered it. Champollion on the basis of the work that Young did. And what did that then mean? It then meant, well, there are an awful lot of hieroglyphics in Egypt that could go and be deciphered. It kind of started a cottage industry because people would, would go to Egypt in the 19th century with their big old land cameras and take photographs of all these monuments and then go back home and start translating based upon the work that Champollion did. That also enabled other things to be translated, like the Egyptian Book of the Dead. And we started to learn an awful lot about Egyptian mythology, religion, etc., etc. Okay, we'll stop there since I've gone over here. So we're, we're a good bit ahead. <clears throat> so that probably means we will get into the Indo-European stuff. Um,